they are the rarest sort of aircraft, the kind of plane that even the most die-hard aviation enthusiasts often just hope to see once in their lifetime. Capable of lifting the biggest, heaviest, and most persistently unwieldy cargo in the world and bringing it halfway across the planet on a moment's notice, they are some of aviation's unsung heroes throughout the past half century or so. They also, and this is a fact, look absolutely ridiculous. It's at this intersection of extreme lift capacity and utterly goofy appearance that we find the Superlifters, an exclusive club of some of the most immense bubble-bodied aircraft of all time. Today's journey begins all the way back in 1960, in the earliest days of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, better known today as NASA. Back in the day, NASA had a lot of overlapping responsibilities, but there was one big overarching task that encompassed most of their missions — build a really massive rocket and launch it into space. It's kind of what NASA does. As it turns out, though, rocket parts can't be made by just anybody, and it's here that NASA found themselves in a bit of a quandary that's going to come up again and again and again throughout today's video. Someone with a lot of money, in this case the United States government, had big heavy materials in one place, and they wanted those big heavy materials to be somewhere else, in this case rocket parts that were on the American West Coast that needed to be on the American East Coast. And as we'll see again later, that someone, again NASA, wanted those big heavy materials to move a lot faster than they were currently capable of moving, which in this case had consisted of them being loaded onto barges and eventually tugged all the way down to the Panama Canal and then to the Gulf of Mexico. But as we'll see again and again, the parts NASA needed to move were just so big that the aircraft of the day simply couldn't handle them. I now enter into the picture John M. Conroy, a World War II bomber pilot who saw the potential for a solution in the form of the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser. By this time, the Stratocruiser was obsolete, and while it had been a pioneering plane for commercial aviation, it had gotten no thanks at all from the airline industry. Conroy was aware of the problems over at NASA, and he worked out that the Stratocruiser was actually capable of generating the required lift to carry the rocket parts NASA had in mind. The problem wasn't in their weight, but in the unwieldy shape and size. Yet that problem, too, could be fixed, if only the dimensions of the Stratocruiser could be changed. When Conroy presented his idea to NASA, it received only a muted response, but nonetheless, he pushed on anyhow. Conroy established a company to build his concept aircraft, and using a Stratocruiser that had been sold off by its last airline, he modified the plane to add a new 6-meter-wide upper fuselage slapped on top of the current fuselage. The tail and rear section of the plane were made so that they could be taken off to load cargo, and the entire thing was given a cohesive outer layer of metal sheeting to keep it aerodynamic. The result was an aircraft that, for its time, would have looked like a monstrosity. If we imagine the front of the plane as its face, then the pregnant guppy had a forehead that a gang of middle schoolers would describe as a five head. But when it <laughs> pretty good. But when it took to the skies for the first time during an unsanctioned test flight in September 1962, in which not one but two of its four engines were non-functional, the plane somehow performed pretty beautifully. Within just a few months of its first flight, Conroy's plane, named the Pregnant Guppy as a tongue-in-cheek nod to a comment made by a NASA official when the idea was first presented, had now been approved to haul NASA's cargo. In the early months, it could move components of the Titan II rockets for the Gemini program. Later, it would carry parts of the Saturn I rockets. Flying cross country with a crew of three, the pregnant guppy could at speeds of 370 miles per hour, just under 600 kilometers per hour, although it cruised at 224 miles per hour or 361 kilometers an hour. In all, it could carry payloads of up to 34,000 pounds or 17 tons doing the work of the prior sea barges in a fraction of the time and at a lower overall cost. The pregnant guppy would serve NASA until 1974, at which time it was sold off to carry airline parts for a couple of years before retirement. But if the pregnant guppy was somehow not impressive enough already, it's here that we introduce its successor craft, the Super Guppy. This was built at a time when NASA's rocket ambitions had moved beyond what one solitary pregnant guppy could carry in its fuselage, let alone what it could carry while taking one-at-a-time trips across the US. And this subsequent line of five Super Guppies was an answer to all of NASA's problems. It was designed to carry a completed S-5B stage of the Saturn V rocket, which was to form the backbone of the Apollo program during the 1960s. 
The Super Guppy used a heavier duty military grade version of the Stratocruiser known as the C 97 Stratofreighter. To accommodate the cargo it'd be carrying, the fuselage was lengthened from 110 to 141 feet, with an interior compartment of 25 feet. It was also given new engines to boost its power and range, and its tail and wings were altered to increase lift and maneuverability. All told, the Super Guppy could carry a load of 54,000 pounds, 27 tons, or a full 10 tons more than the pregnant Guppy had been able to. It cruised along at a much faster 300 miles per hour, 480 kilometers an hour, at a range of nearly 2,000 miles, which is just over 3,200 kilometers. The Super Guppy program, though, nearly ended in tragedy when in 1965 the prototype suffered a fuselage collapse in its upper bulbous section while practicing high speed dives at Edwards Air Force Base. Luckily, all parties survived the accident and the aircraft was saved before being rebuilt with significant reinforcement to its upper fuselage. The second model was built with even better engines and was modified to lengthen the cargo compartment even more. Four of those later models, the Super Guppy turbines, were constructed in total, including two made by the then-independent UTA French Airlines. Also during this time, two smaller Mini Guppy planes would be constructed, offering a smaller packaged version of the same features as their predecessors. Today, one Super Guppy still flies with NASA, where it is the last operational Boeing 377 in the world. Now it does double duty for the Department of Defense and other government contractors have used it to move, among other things, entire other aircraft nestled inside its upper fuselage. It continues to beat out the US military's heaviest lift aircrafts, including the C-5 Galaxy, in terms of the sheer size of the cargo it can carry, and it's likely to play a major role in preparation for America's Artemis series of moon missions. Three others are on display, including one in Arizona, one in Toulouse, and one in Hamburg. From the Super Guppy, we move to the Dreamlifter, better known as the Boeing 747-400 Large Cargo Freighter, or LCF. First announced in 2003 and first taken to the skies in 2006, Boeing's fleet of four Dreamlifters is a far more sophisticated advancement of the oversized load-carrying aircraft. But where the Super Guppy and some of the other planes that we'll discuss today are distinguished by their bulbous upper fuselage, the Dreamlifter is distinguished by its gargantuan humpback. The Dreamlifter was conceived just over two decades ago, as the Boeing company got to work on its most recent line of commercial airliners, the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. It's from the Dreamliner that the Dreamlifter gets its name. The Dreamlifter is the heavy lifter for parts that will eventually be built into the Dreamliner. Pretty straightforward stuff there. The parts needed for the Dreamliner were too big to fit inside standard shipping containers to travel around the world for assembly, not to mention that sea shipping took far too much time, and neither Boeing's available heavy lift aircraft nor the Antonov AN-124 or AN-225 were big enough to move the required parts either. Instead, Boeing took matters into their own hands, deciding to convert four used 747s into a fleet of heavy lifters that Boeing could have on hand for future projects as well. The Dreamlifter's unpressurized cargo section hits a total width of 27.5 feet, with an interior tall enough to handle any of the cargo that Boeing intended on shipping around the world. The plane boasted a payload capacity of a quarter million pounds, 125 tons, more than four and a half times that of what NASA's Super Guppy is able to lift. The main cargo compartment comes with a volume of 65,000 cubic feet, and the planes can cruise at a speed of 541 miles or 871 kilometers an hour, which is not much slower than the Boeing 787 that it was intended to build. With a range of 4,800 miles, 7,800 kilometers, the Dreamlifter was more than able to make transatlantic flights. It featured an opening and closing tail compartment and uses the world's biggest cargo loader, the DBL-100, to get its cargo in and out. The Dreamlifter wasn't exactly pretty, at least in its early days, but it proved to be more than capable of passing all of its flight tests, and it began service just a couple of years after its conception in the summer of 2007. By 2010, all four Dreamlifters were operational, and since then, they've been primarily used for Boeing's internal operations, transporting heavy airplane parts all over the world. The plane distinguished itself, although accidentally in 2013, when, after mistakenly landing at the wrong airport, a Dreamlifter was able to take off again, despite that airport's runway being over 3,000 feet or 940 meters shorter than what the plane was supposed to need in order to get into the sky. During the COVID pandemic, a Dreamlifter stuffed with half a million face masks landed in Salt Lake City as part of state relief efforts. Otherwise, the Dreamlifter's career has been thus far quiet and unremarkable, which really is exactly what you want from a dependable heavy lift aircraft. So, moving on from US based superlifters, we come to the Airbus Beluga family of aircraft, the absolutely gigantic Beluga Supertransporter and the somehow even bigger Beluga XL. 
Like Boeing's Dreamlifter, the Beluga was a response to need from inside Airbus itself, where heavy lift aircraft offered the best option to transport oversized aircraft parts from Airbus manufacturers to assembly lines. For a while, Airbus had used the aforementioned Super Cuppy airlifters to do the job, but by the 1990s, those aircraft were, well, old as bones. In other words, existing alternatives had enough internal space to carry what Airbus needed, and the idea of just strapping airplane parts to the back of another plane was a bit of a non-starter. In 1992, construction began on what would be the first of a series of Airbus planes that were designated the Super Transporter. The base for their plane was the fuselage of the Airbus A300-600, a dependable commercial airliner that had the airframe and lift capacity to expand into a bulbous upper fuselage. Airbus would eventually build five Super Transporters at a rate of one airframe per year. The first entered service in January 1996, and within two years' time, the Airbus fleet of Super Guppies were allowed to gracefully waltz onward into retirement. The Beluga is, all things considered, a pretty cool aircraft. Powered by two General Electric turbofan engines, not four engines like the other planes we've discussed thus far, and flown by a crew of three, the Beluga can haul loads of over 103,000 pounds or 51.5 tons. Its internal compartment has a diameter of over 23 feet, with a total cargo hold capacity of 53,000 cubic feet. The plane flies at a maximum speed of 537 miles an hour or 864 kilometers an hour with a range of 1700 miles or nearly 2800 kilometers when it's carrying heavy payloads. It features a roll-on, roll-off loading system, and while it's not quite big enough to carry the fuselage of the Airbus A380, it's able to carry just about anything else that Airbus can stuff into its cargo hold. When it entered service, the Beluga fleet was charged primarily with ferrying Airbus's own aircraft components across 11 sites in Europe, which, with the fleet in full operation, they accomplish via 60 flights each week. The Belugas can be chartered for other purposes, and they've carried everything from precious artwork to parts of space stations to entire helicopters in their cargo bays. The planes have been continually upgraded, and they've been given a specialized Beluga-only loading station at an airport in Wales where high winds had typically been an impediment to their operations. The Beluga has set multiple records for distance and payload volume, it's delivered desperately needed relief supplies on several occasions worldwide, and it's boasted a fantastic safety record, on par with some of the most dependable and accident-immune planes in the world. But. Even that whale of a plane couldn't satisfy Airbus's appetite for heavy lift capacity, and by January of 2020, well, it wouldn't have to. By then, a whole other beast had taken to the skies on Airbus's behalf, the Beluga XL, an even bigger, even badder version of the Beluga aircraft. With a program that started in 2014 and took its first flight in 2018, the Beluga XL uses the more advanced fuselage of the twin-engine Airbus A330 as its base. On top, it grafts an even bigger bubble fuselage, one that's 23 feet longer and 5.5 and feet wider than the original Beluga. That means a capacity 30% higher by volume and a payload increase of 6 tons, which, by the way, it can load in half the time using more efficient systems. It's got a significantly greater range than the original Beluga, it's less than 100 miles per hour slower in speed, and it's reinforced with a much heavier duty frame that allows it to carry not one, but two full-sized Airbus A350 airliner wings inside it. Airbus would build a fleet of six Beluga XLs, with the final plane, at the time of writing, just wrapping up preparations to begin regular operation after completing its first flight in July of 2023. It's also got a winking Beluga whale face painted on it, whereas all the others got a regular smiley face. As the fleet ramps up its service capacity, it'll take over operations for the first-line Belugas, while offering not just additional cargo space, but a whole other plane to scale up Airbus's manufacturing operations. The five first-line models will be phased into a new division, Airbus Beluga Transport, where they'll likely move into a primary role doing contract transport for commercial customers. Those contracts are in high demand. By February of 2023, Airbus had filled nearly half of its contract transport slots for the year. All told, the Beluga XL is an improvement on the first-line Belugas in just about every way, making them not just the biggest, but the most dependable fleet of heavy-lift aircraft in the entire world. Still no word, though, on whether Airbus might adapt some A380 frames into a Beluga XXXL someday. It's a good idea, though, Airbus. Take notes. And finally, we come to it. The absolute unit, king of the skies, dare we say the goat, the Antonov AN-225 Maria. 
We've already done two separate videos on this aircraft on Mega Project, so we're not going to belabor the point too much. But nevertheless, we've got to give the Maria a shout out and illustrate just how unbelievably gargantuan it was compared to even the superlifters that we've discussed so far. Weighing into maximum takeoff weight of 1.4 million pounds or 700 tons, of which a full 270 tons or more were made up of pure payload, the six crew, six engine Maria could haul unbelievable volumes across a range of 15,400 kilometers or 9,600 miles miles. That's over 16 times the payload capacity of the pregnant guppy, 10 times the capacity of the super guppy, 5 times that of Beluga, 4.5 times that of the Beluga XL, and well over double the capacity of the Boeing Dreamlifter. Instead of a blown out upper bubble fuselage, the Maria featured a very long cargo hold at 142 feet or 43.5 meters in the plane's massive belly. But it's in looking at the Maria that the advantage of these other lower payload superlifters really becomes evident. Because while the AN-225 could put any one of them to shame in terms of pure tonnage, it couldn't beat any of them, even the pregnant guppy of the early 1960s, when it came to payload size. The ceiling of the Maria's cargo hold was just 14 feet high, and it's just 21 feet wide. What that means is that the Super Guppy, the Beluga, and the Dreamlifter are doing work that truly no other airplane can do. Not the AN-225, not the heavy lifters built by Aleutian, not the standard Boeing or Airbus freighters, and not any aircraft built or bought by any military in the world. If there are different strokes for different folks, well, there are different cargo holds for different cargo loads, and when it comes to the work of the superlifters, there are just some areas where those goofy-looking, bubble-bodied planes are simply untouchable.